Hello, and welcome to the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, head over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information about all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Today, we're discussing the absolutely charming movie, Good Night Oppie, a surefire crowd pleaser of a documentary that I had the pleasure of seeing at the Telluride Film Festival a few months ago. And luckily for you, it is now available to watch via the Prime Video streaming service in Dolby Atmos. Good Night Oppie tells the story of two Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, which were sent to the Red Planet back in 2003 and were expected to survive long enough to collect data for hopefully 90 days. Instead, they blew everyone's expectations away, and one of them lasted for over 15 years. Joining me on the podcast today is the director, Ryan White, who took years of archival footage from NASA to craft the story of these inspiring robots and the scientists and engineers who built and operated them for over a decade. Joining Ryan is a friend of this podcast, the sound designer, Mark Mangini, who served as the film's re-recording mixer, sound designer, and supervising sound editor. You may remember Mark from our conversation with him and the team behind the first installment of Dune, which landed him an Academy Award for Best Sound last year, and previously for his work on Mad Max Fury Road. But I began today's conversation with Ryan, who is mostly known for his cinema verite documentaries. I wanted to know what drew him to this particular film and its departure from his usual cinematic style. Here's Ryan. Well, the big challenge from the very beginning is if I'm going to be the director of this film, I want it to feel like it's unfolding in real time. That's what my films do. I'm not a historical documentary filmmaker, and there are much better historical documentary filmmakers that could have taken on that task. And so my conversation with Amblin and Film 45 was, can we... Are you open to making this not a retrospective film that's just looking back at the life of opportunity? Are you open open to doing it as an adventure tale? And so, as you mentioned, we had the archival, which was almost a thousand hours of footage from NASA that began, you know, before day one. It began when opportunity was just an idea in somebody's head. So we knew we had that element to create a present tense story. Um, but I didn't want it just to be an earthbound story. I wanted it to also take place on Mars. And I didn't want that just to be like grainy black and white photos, you know, and your more traditional science documentary. And so I asked Amblin, like, is it possible to put the audience on Mars almost as if I could be there with my documentary crew during this adventure in a way that is photo real? And then Amblin said, we don't know, but luckily our best friends are industrial light magic and we can get you a phone call with them. And that was the question we posed to them. I remember saying, like, I don't want to, I don't want to even entertain this path if it's going to feel like a cartoon because I'm a documentary filmmaker. Like this has to be deeply rooted in the reality of what we know Mars looks like, because it's not a mystery anymore. Spirit and Opportunity each had nine cameras on her. We know what every day of their journeys looked like. And so we were able to supply all of that photography and all of the data that NASA could give us. So, for instance, weather or where, where the sun rose and sun set on a day or how much dust was in the, the air on a certain day that spirit was going through. And we asked Industrial Light Magic, like, can you take all of this information, all of this data and create a photo real Mars? And they said, we've never done that before but we love a challenge. We will build Mars from the ground up for you. Um, but that was also 2020. And they said, this is going to take a long time. So we need to know what you want now, which is why this is the only documentary I've ever, I've ever written a screenplay before, because if we were going to put the audience on Mars, that was going to take two years to be photo real. So we had to choose what those scenes would be um, very early on. And I don't see it so much as like, you know, it's so rooted in reality. It's a documentary way of doing visual effects, which I'm sure we'll speak about with Mark as well in his area of expertise that we did on this film. And so I don't really see it as 
pushing boundaries of the documentary form that much. How I see it is documentary filmmakers getting access to the toolkit that scripted Hollywood filmmakers have had forever. And why can't our films, if they, if they can use it, most docs don't need it, but if they could use it, why can't our docs have access to those toolkits that make it that much more entertaining, make it that much more commercial, but are still documentaries because they're rooted in reality? I, I like I like the way you approach that. And I, I think this is a great opportunity to bring Mark into the conversation because uh, obviously, you know, you, you turn to ILM to create this huge portion of the film from a uh, from a visual standpoint. And in, in that sense, Mark, it's, it's almost like uh, like an animated film. You're you're getting these images. Obviously, there's no production track. And I don't believe uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that the original Mars rovers recorded audio. Did they? they, they were, it was just it was just images. And that so is correct. So you're literally starting with you're literally literally starting with nothing. So, uh, you know, you have a great challenge in front of you. So I get first of all, I want to ask you, Ryan. How did you how did you find Mark and why did you know that he was the right person for this film? Well, I didn't know Mark already. I knew Mark's name, of course, and it came through Amblin and uh, Film 45. They both knew Mark's reputation and the the motto of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is dare mighty things, right? Like they take on these these um these innovative challenges that that they're told are impossible and they try uh, to achieve the impossible. And we felt like if we're going to make this film, um, we needed to swing for the bleachers in a way that we don't typically, it's not normally needed in our documentaries. And why not go to the sound designer of Mad Max Fury Road and Dune and let him say no? Um, there's no harm in no. My, that's what my, my biggest lesson my dad ever imparted on me was no is an acceptable answer. Um, and I've gotten very good in my career at just asking for something and getting a no. Um, and it was much the opposite. We got on a phone call with Mark and um, Mark can probably remember this better than I am, but I believe you'd seen the pitch reel yeah, um, before, yeah. which ha again, we hadn't shot a frame of footage. It was basically me walking. It was intended for buyers, uh, but it was me walking potential distributors through on what this film could be. But when we got on a Zoom with Mark, there was a passion there for this subject matter and this story and doing it as authentically as possible um, that was that was so um, that was so incredible. And we wanted to work with him and we are lucky enough to say yes, but I still don't know why he said yes. So maybe he can answer that. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm on the spot. <laughs> Mark, you want to you want to weigh in on that? Sure. There's, boy, there's an awful lot to weigh in on uh, in terms of the involvement. I, like Ryan, had um, aspirations to be an astronaut. Not that I ever could have been one or even attempted to make it come true, because what I really wanted to be was a filmmaker. And I remember like it was yesterday watching Neil Armstrong put his first footsteps on the moon and feeling something deep deeply moving inside of myself. So the uh, opportunity, no pun intended, to be a part of this project and for it to be, you know, I, I, I give Ryan a great deal of credit to being as verite as possible with this project. And, and that was kind of part of my credo in terms of the sound design was to be as original as possible. Um, so, and then I saw this pitch reel and it was just, I, I just wanted to geek out on the science and I felt, and I might've said in the early conversation with Ryan and Jess, if I get to go to NASA or JPL so I can record the real sounds um, I'm in. And that, I, I was just, I was so, I was, you know, they had me at hello. I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw the clip and I wanted to be an astronaut and I saw a huge sound design challenge of creating a, a Martian world from scratch and trying to be as true as possible in whatever way I could. And those are the things that drive me these days. It's not big budgets or, or superheroes. It's, you know, sound challenges. And this presented one. And Ryan and Jeff are just two of the nicest people in the world. And that's massively important to me is making every experience I have at this point in my life a really fun filmmaking experience. 
Well, you both talked about authenticity uh, in the track. So Mark, can you talk about the steps that you took and how you how you tried? Because obviously, you know, you, you, we don't have any reference material. It's all CG. You could have gone completely bonkers uh, with this, but I, I feel like it was important for you that it be rooted in some kind of reality. So can you talk about your approach to designing the sound and making sure that that was the case? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I really felt uh, a deep responsibility. And as you know, I'm not a documentary sound designer necessarily. This is the first one I've done. But I, I felt somewhere inside of me that I had to be as true as we could be, given I can't bring an immersive microphone to Mars, and capture those atmospheres. But importantly, uh, there, there's a good jumping off point in terms of sound. As I was developing the sounds of the Martian atmosphere, um, which is something Ryan and I had discussed at length in our uh, early meetings and imagining, I knew there was weather, I knew there was some kind of atmosphere on Mars and I was developing those sounds. Um, we were notified by NASA that, um, uh, I'm spacing, what's the current, Ryan, who's on Mars? What, what rover do we have on Mars today? Perseverance, Perseverance, Perseverance. actually had two DPK 4060s on board and sent back to NASA for the first time in history of the human race, the sound of another planet, the sound of an alien environment, if you will. And that included a very short snippet of the atmosphere of Mars, the sound of the ambience of Oppie just sitting in the middle of a, a, a rock plane. And that, that just gave me goosebumps. And I, I completely rerouted my trajectory and took this little 20 second snippet of a Martian atmosphere and was stretching and multiplying and all sorts of other clever tricks, turned it into an immersive atmosphere of Mars. And in fact, the opening of the movie in black, before you see anything, the very first thing you hear is the sound of Mars. And that, that, that is, you know, that's just major, major, major goosebump stuff for me. And then, you know, Ryan and Jess made good on their promise and connected me <clears throat> with the folks at JPL in Pasadena and got me access to the test beds where they test the existing um, or remaining uh, pieces of rovers like the ones that are on Mars. So I got to record Perseverance and Opportunity and all those unique sounds. And so, um, you know, we all of that sound of Oppie, except for a couple of things which we'll talk about, are are the authentic sounds. And I, I felt really duty bound to, to present it that way. Um, and, and so, you know, I got to go out with sound recorders and, and vest myself in a uh, protective suit because um, Perseverance um, is nuclear powered and it has a lot of power on board. And if you hang a boom mic too close to it, you know, 10 trillion volts can jump from the rover to the boom pole and turn me into a French fry. So while recording, I had to wear this very inelegant lab coat with metal shielding on it to ground me to earth so I wouldn't die. So. For both of you, I'm really, I'm really curious about this, um, I guess the topic of anthropomorphizing. Uh, we, have a, we have a very long, illustrious history in the movie business of adorable robots that become lifelike to us. Going back to you know Robbie the robot, and then of course you know I'm thinking about R2D2 and Wally and and Oppie and uh, uh, your robots obviously take on a, a great personality. So can you talk about your approach to you know humanizing them in a way and instilling personality in them and how sound played a role in that? Anthropomorphizing the the verb with way too many syllables that I've that I've finally mastered saying was always our mantra in the edit room was that we cannot anthropomorphize the robots more than the human beings who are telling the story are willing to like we can't in our visuals put eyebrows on the robot like Wally has and it turns out eyebrows are very expressive uh, and we have very little to work with in the in as far as the visuals with opportunity and spirit there's not a lot of exciting action happening uh in that robot's visuals there's a few lenses in their eyes which are their cameras and aperture changes a little bit what we which we use uh throughout the film they of course have wheels but they're driving like less than a mile per hour so you can't do a chase scene um they have an arm 
that's a drill, but it doesn't do much except take measurements. And we were bound by that reality that our robots were pretty rudimentary and they didn't do much. So besides our landing scene, which we considered our action scene and the solar flare that happened on the way to the landing, and there's a lot of action that happens in both of them, once the rovers land, there isn't much you can do with them. And Mars is the same place. Like Mars is a relatively boring place day to day, you know, and we have some amazing scenes of dust devils and then huge dust storms that take over the planet later on. And they did like climb down a little bit into craters and slip down. Um, but like their day to day life on Mars also wasn't that um, exciting. And so it's really the human beings telling the stories that infuse that motion or that anthropomorphizing into the robots because these robots are an extension of the human beings themselves, right? Like they don't exist. The robots don't exist without these human beings having created them and driving them every day. It's just we as human beings can't go to this sa- to this place safely yet. Um, and so opportunity and spirit are those brave little intrepid explorers who are doing what we can't do ourselves. And so this idea, I think that we have a robot there instead of ourselves and she is alone or she's on the other side of the planet, at least than her twin sister. You can't help but feel something for her because she is the brave one while we're back home exploring, you know, literally an uncharted land. And so Mark and I had a lot of conversations about sound and what we could do that would add a little bit of expression um, to the character of, of the rovers without, you know, without going over the top, without making them R2-D2. Um, and we did a lot of that through the messaging that happens between, um, between Earth and Mars, which actually used to be a whole full scene in our film where we detailed how, those, how that communication goes up and down um, which was like another fun action scene of like a roller coaster through a wormhole of outer space of binary code. Um, but we soon realized that the audience understood that type of communication, that type of messaging without, without needing all of that. Um, but that's where we began with Mark was like, well, what about that communication between Earth and Mars? And what can that, what can that language be that isn't totally fictional, but could be like, inside the robot like inside her computer or her hard drive if you were inside her head which is where the messaging begins in our film as she's getting a message to wake up from earth what could that potentially sound like that would give you a soundscape that can add to the character of the robots and i mean mark worked hard on that and this was early this was before we locked picture mark started experimenting with this stuff because i was saying to him like we need to know if that's going to work or not work. Otherwise, we're going to have to figure out something else. Or we might have to do less less CGI in the film if it's going to be, if the sound can't bring it a little bit more alive. That's all that Mark to speak to is experimentation. But I've never gotten like more files in my life than of like beeps and bops than when Mark was doing the language of the robots. And I'll let, I'll let him take it over from here. Sure. Um yeah, the that that the communication between NASA and the rovers was really the the key to unlocking what what I'll call the voice of Oppie would be, and I and I, I use the word voice advisedly. Um, uh, Ryan is very correct that that you know the scientists were so invested in these rovers they felt like their children, and I think that gave us permission to anthropomorphize them just a little bit. So, um, you know, we had the sort of Chiron-like, you know, the communications back and forth. And we thought, well, if NASA speaks to Oppie, Oppie can speak to NASA, but of course not in English. So it, and I, and in this, um, realm of verite and authenticity, I thought, I don't want this to be, with all due respect, uh, R2-D2 and, and anything whimsical, I want it to be grounded in something reality-based. So I thought, well, I know Oppie has a computer on board and I had these recordings of hard drive chatter. You know, when you send data to or pull from, a, you hear those funny little clicky noises. And I thought, well, that's the secret. The way we'll make it feel anthropomorphic is to make it 
those sounds come in the meter and pacing of language. Syllables, consonants, fricatives, plosives. So I thought, well, all right, I'll take digital hard drive sounds and make them feel like a sentence. So if Oppie said something like, um, I'm scared, I just saw my shadow, I would say that in English. I would record my voice and then using digital technology, <laughs> I morphed that into the hard disk chitters for um, uh, re coming out in the same cadence and wa a wave shape or envelope of speech. So syllable di chitters would go like my voice did with consonants and syllables. And so it gave the audience that sort of sense of, it feels like something's talking, but sure isn't vocal cords. It's something mechanical and robotic. And that, that's where we finally landed. And it, it was successful without it being beepy and boopy. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you, you mentioned um, the wake ups. I, I feel like the wake up song and the entire concept of the wake up song was a huge gift to you as a filmmaker. So can you can you tell our audience, uh, uh, you know, how how that as a as a thing came to be for NASA uh, and uh, uh and then I have a I have a cheeky question for you, which is I'm I'm curious, were there any wake up songs that you weren't able to clear to put in the film? <laughs> Two very good questions. And yes, they were a complete gift. I could not have written this better into a screenplay. So a wake up song is a song that was played in Mission Control on Earth to wake the robot up every morning. And that is a tradition that's derived from human spaceflight. And so songs would be played to wake up astronauts when they're ready to begin their day of work. And this team at JPL was living on what's called Mars time, which often meant that they were working um, in the middle of the night. They would be begin their shifts at 1 a.m. And so they were constantly jet lagged. And you have to remind ourselves that this mission was only supposed to last for 90 days. So they only thought they were going to be doing this for three months, even though it went on for 15 years. Likewise, the wake up song tradition went on for 15 years and was just kind of a fun thing to do at the beginning and then became this massive library of music because somebody at NASA every morning got to pick what that song would be that would wake the robot up. And usually the lyrics or the title of that song had something to do with what the rover was going to be doing that day or something that the rover was going through, whether that was like aging or arthritis. So the songs are very relevant to whatever is happening. So you couldn't ask for anything better as a storyteller when you get footage of a wake up song being played in mission control. And it relates to whatever the crisis that Rover is going through at that point. A great example in our film is ABBA's SOS. They play in mission control when Spirit goes missing. Um, in her first 30 days, she stops, she stops phoning home as they say. Um, and they play Abba's SOS in this moment of crisis, thinking that they have lost their rover. And you see this amazing moment, Mission Control, where people are very sad. But then as the Abba chorus comes in, people start mouthing along the words and frowns turn upside down. And it really changed them around the room. And uh, spoiler alert, they end up finding Spirit and getting her back. And she survives for another seven years plus. Um, and so it was a it was a really beautiful and entertaining way to um, insert emotion into these scenes, especially on Mars, which which Mark did, um, you know, a ton of experimentation and had fun with and how we would and, and, and how we would play with the acoustics of how we play these songs, you know, as they move between Earth and Mars and and in between um, at times. And the honest God answer to your second question is we got our top seven songs. There was not one song where we went to a record label and they said no, or they said, we want, we will allow you to do this, but it's going to be this amount, which is outside of your budget. I had made a Beatles film before. My second film was about the Beatles secretary. And we were one of the first films, like the Hollywood Reporter, I remember wrote an article about the little documentary that pulled off the impossible we were one of the first films, at least in like 30 something years that had gotten permission to use Beatles music. And it took me years to line up those permissions. Uh, and then suddenly we have Here Comes the Sun in this film. 
And I, I believe that might be even the Beatles' number one song on Spotify. So not even a rare Beatles song or like, you know, a B-side. Like, like may, perhaps their top, top hit, at least by today's standards. And then I remember our music supervisor saying like, oh, you think the Beatles are hard? You know, the second hardest is ABBA. Um, and those scenes were critical to our film. And I was prepared for devastation. Uh, and I have to say, there is something special. We had a wonderful music supervisor and she she managed our expectations. Like this probably won't work out, especially in a documentary budget, but I will try. And I remember her saying like, there is something about getting to call these record labels and say, don't hang up on me, hear me out. We're not using Here Comes the Sun or SOS as soundtrack. Like Ryan didn't pick that song because he loves that song and it's adorable to play to a robot. It's actually being played during a moment of crisis or, you know, on a day of discovery. And she said, like, time after time, the pitch was so different that it made their ears perk up and they took it to the bands in a way that doesn't normally happen. And so not one, all seven of our top songs, we didn't even have to, you know, replace one in the end. It was a true... um embarrassment of riches because you know those seven songs there's hundreds if not thousands of amazing songs that they were played and there's a couple of those songs that i don't even like uh as a song but they were so important to the scene so the day when you give up you know fleetwood max go your own way in favor of i won't even say the ones i don't like or you give up bowie's life on mars for another one because it played in mission control and it played a more important story point was a difficult day, but it was all in service of the story. And yeah, we couldn't have been given a bigger gift by NASA. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, Mark, Ryan brought up the work that you did to kind of integrate those songs into the, and I love, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not factually accurate, but it, you, you introduced this small speaker futz when we, when we're on Mars, his, listening to this, almost as if the robots have a little speaker, like then they're, they're listening to it themselves, right? Mea culpa. Yeah. Well, that, that that was always part of the the, the storyline that's that was inherent in the, the story Ryan's trying to tell. You know, it, uh, arguably, I'm equally guilty as charged for seeing a wide shot of Mars and hearing here comes the sun echoing into space. <laughs> you know, yeah, we had sound in space. We had rockets flying by and sun flares and arguably would never hear any of that. You're, you're getting, you're getting to a, a deeper emotional truth, not the literal truth of what happened. I recognize that. Thank you. <laughs> well, somebody's going to call us out for it. We'll, we'll get some haters. I'm, I'm sure. Well, we talked about that. I had a, I had that question in a and a the other day by, you know, there's going to be a lot of space nuts and they they like love to find inaccuracies. And I, I agree with that. I love having those conversations. And Mark and I, we would have those conversations about, you know, even on Mars itself where the atmosphere is so thin and therefore everything is so quiet. Do we stay so rooted to like if Mark himself were shooting on a boom in Mars and we're like, that's we can't make a silent Mars film. Then, then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna test the patience of our audience if there's no sound world. So, we are willing to play a version of acoustics on Mars as if you would hear it on Earth. Um, and actually, it, it sounds like Mars might be a lot louder than people thought it might be because I've heard that the helicopter that's with Perseverance they were shocked at how loud it was when it was flying around. So, no one knows anyway. No one's been there. So. We felt a little creative, creative leeway to, you know, create a soundscape that would that would sustain the emotion. And exactly like you said, be a more of a philosophical and emotional truth than necessarily at always like the holding to the acoustic standard if our ear was on Mars. You know, just a, a, a quick beat on the music. Um, just having here comes the sun under my fingers at the console made me nervous. The fact that I would do anything to it and I'd get a call from Giles Martin or Paul McCartney. <laughs> what did what you did do you, to our did you do my song? It had me honestly petrified. <laughs> Somebody's going to call me out. But you did get to have some fun. Um, you know, uh, Ryan, you, you, you brought up uh, ABBA's S SOS, which you treat literally when you're in the control room. But then you, you also go to an 
you transition to an, an orchestral version and you use it as score, which is a really beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. And my editor, Rez Cabrera, your editors do these things early on that you don't even realize they've done and then you get totally married to and you don't want to let it go. And he did that just like in his, he, he found that footage. We didn't know that footage existed. And he said, give me a couple days. I found something special. I'm working on something special and I'll show it to you. And I'm a control freak like most directors. And I love to see something all day long or at least at the end of every day. And, but he knows, he knows me well. I know him well. And he said, give me a couple of days. And he not only had found Abba's SOS, but he did that full like orchestral version in the middle as the satellites go up to Mars and trying to communicate with her. And Abba said yes to us doing that. And we had to, we had to have an orchestra play that, but they, they must have liked the version that they saw that they gave us, that they gave us permission to do that in the middle of their song. It's a, it's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful moment. And uh, we're talking about the, the ABBA SOS song. I, I want to use this as an excuse to, to, to dive into a discussion of the archival footage, which was sort of maybe the, even, even better than the wake up songs, uh, another huge gift that you got in the making of this film. I, as I was watching it again, Watching that ABBA SOS sequence, I, I was just struck by, you know, you have, you mentioned a thousand hours of archival footage that was recorded, you know, through all these events that NASA gave you access to. I think if, if you'd been making a narrative feature film out of these events and the ABBA SOS scene had come up in the script, I don't think you could have shot it better than the archival footage that you got to put that sequence together. So can you talk a little bit about I mean, obviously, it's 15 years of material. I'm sure the sources are all over the place, you know, the kind of and but it all sounds great. So, Mark, what can you talk about the challenges of working with all that archival footage and what you had to do? Sort of to us and a total curse to Mark. So. <laughs> well, uh, that was really maybe the, the, the single biggest challenge I I wanted, I, you know, Reg and Helen, our two editors, did a wonderful job building these sequences from all that archival footage, but it's in mono. It's, you know, it's a handy cam, it's a camcorder. Uh, I don't even think iPhones were around. Um, and you only have mono audio, and we had a goal of not only using sound immersively, but using sound immersively because I think it, 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 aids and abets the audience investment in in believability and verisimilitude you know that what's that old expression um suspension of disbelief one of the ways to get there is to present believable 360 degree audio because that's the way we hear so i had this conundrum of mono sync track from all this archival footage and uh you know dolby atmos audio environment that i wanted to fill up and so that meant <clears throat> I also, Jessica, our producer, gave me the brick, the thousand hours, or almost all of it. And I went through hundreds of hours listening to everybody's handy cam footage from a moment to find little pieces of control room chatter or experimentation of Oppie in the test beds to, if not steal little snippets that hadn't been found by the film editors, to understand what it really sounded like so I could do my best job to mimic that sound with something else. And that's just a time commitment. That's just hours and hours of me sitting at the workstation watching this footage, which, you know, quite honestly, I shouldn't complain because I got to geek out. I got to watch scientists do what they do and problem solve in real time. And that was, that was a gift. Yeah. Well, you, br Mark, you bring up the issue of time and I know, um, this is a complex mix. It's a really rich, dense soundtrack, and that does not fly into place overnight or all at once. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I would love, Ryan, for you to talk about sort of the philosophy of getting the getting the resources for Mark from a budgetary and a time standpoint that he needed to do this extraordinary work. I feel I feel like you probably had a lot more time than a than a typical feature documentary. Before he's, I just want to acknowledge Ryan and Jess because that's one of the things that really drew me in is that I knew docs, they never come to me because usually they don't have the kind of budgets I'm accustomed to and they found a way to do it. And that, 
that's an acknowledgement of how passionate they were going to be about sound for this documentary. And that's, that's a real testament to these, these two filmmakers. We wanted Mark to come on early as well, which, you know, I don't, I guess you don't always do, and you definitely don't normally do on documentaries, but it was, it was crucial that some of what Mark was going to be doing was going to dictate some of the story. So we needed to know some of these sounds. So Mark did like a, a, a lot of pre-work, you know, not, not mixing, but like creating, creating like basically a library of sound, especially of the Rover language as we called it, but also just driving and wind and things that my editors could then use as a toolkit to know if a scene was going to work or not work. Um, and so we were asking a lot there too. And yeah, we were at, we were mixing this during the holidays, wasn't it, Mark, at the end of last year? Um, and it was much longer than what you would normally do on a dock, but it needed that. I mean, it needed that that time. And we had also just we were just finishing our our visual renders from Industrial Light and Magic. So for a long time, you're watching a film, um, and I know Mark is probably used to this and in many of the films that he's worked on with VFX, but I'm definitely not in documentary where you're watching a film with sketches um, that are in there. I remember when Mark and I did our first spotting session and it was mostly just black and white pencil sketches in the film. And he's, you know, pausing it every 10 seconds saying like, what's happening here? What, what are you going to want to be hearing? But it was really fun. We did a few days of just pausing the film every 10 seconds and saying like, What's going to what's going to happen? How do you want this to come alive? But that was really creatively fruitful, I think. Yeah, that, that was really good. Yeah, that, that was a joy. Ryan and I had had, I think, I guess I recorded them all four or five sessions, one per reel, where we would, lit, as he said, stop on these, uh, you know, pencil sketches and say, and, and, and it was a, a wonderful collaboration because I'd ask Ryan what, what, did you want to hear here? And what's the action? What do you envision Oppie doing? And inversely, he'd ask me, well, what kind of sounds could we use? And so it was a really lovely um, exchange during that period. Ryan, you talked about it as uh, as the action sequence, uh, which is, you know, the traveling to Mars and the solar flare. And I, my favorite, you know, from a sound perspective, one of my favorite sequences in the film is, is what you call the six minutes of terror. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> and the landing on Mars. So Mark, that's a big sound moment. Can you just uh, take a, take a minute and unpack for us sort of the elements of that and how you approach that pretty dramatic sound sequence? Boy, that's, that's just seat of the pants. Um, just make it exciting because it is our set piece in our, our action sequence. I kind of brought to it the same sensibilities I'd bring to a car chase. Um, you know, everything has to have movement. Everything has to have sound. Um, you, you want to be, um, dynamic, uh, that this is going to be the, the big kind of in your face, um, uh, you know, sound moment. And it was, you know, oddly those sequences aren't as challenging to me as things like voices for robots and what does Mars sound like? I, I don't know. Maybe I've done this long enough that I just have a general sense of what what kind of sounds create motion and create excitement. And that sequence built pretty quickly, actually. That that was not the challenge that you might think it was, although the 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 only stumbling block I remember having was the um when the the balutes inflate uh to protect Oppie and it drops down onto the Martian service. I had nothing like that in my library. And I, I did a great deal of original recording. We, maybe we'll get to the arthritis elements as well, among other things. And uh, in, in, a, in a moment of inspiration, I was wandering around the house and I saw a beach ball um, in the garage and I just deflated it a little bit to make it soft and kind of plumpy. And I just bounced that in the dirt in my backyard. And that's the sound of the the balloons landing and bouncing and bouncing in that over your head. You know, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I think I, I was. I told you before we were rolling that uh, I got to see the film in a theater at Telluride Film Festival, and I mean, it's always so much fun for me. That I love at film festivals going to see documentary films with an audience because you don't often get a chance to do that. And this was a particular movie that played very well with an audience. But that moment. You know, it's it's a I know that it's a beach ball that you recorded in your backyard in the dirt, but the way you treated it and mixed it, 
it's so violent when it hits the ground and bounces and then goes over your head. It the audience had a big reaction to it because it's really the way the way you handle the sound makes it shocking that anything could possibly survive. Well, that's, that that's kind the of story, but that's but that's just I guess good sound design. Arguably, our our function is to tell stories with sound. Sounds are our words, and that's how we 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 tell a little piece of the story without having to have a voiceover or an actor tell you something and they're very efficient and sound that, that's i'm glad you brought it up because the sound in that moment that was a deliberate choice in terms of the sounds i chose and the way i mixed it so that the audience would feel something like as you say oh my god oppie might not make it through this that's that's a little piece of story told without words and that that's what gives me kind of goosebumps it doing what i do when i can achieve that with sound Talking about, you know, communicating an idea through sound and you brought it up, I, you know, I love this notion of the robots getting older and Oppie specifically, um, you know, there's that beautiful moment when, you know, one of the researchers is talking about her grandmother having Alzheimer's and you link that back to Oppie aging. And, you know, I know it's just sand and dirt in the in the mechanism, but the researchers talk about it as, as Oppie having arthritis and she starts to lose her memory, you know, almost as if she has Alzheimer's and it just makes it so human. But I would love Mark for you just to talk about, uh, you, we hear her getting arthritis and can you talk about your approach to those sequences? Yeah, thanks. Um, that was one of the two moments of terror, uh, or six minutes of terror for me with Ryan, because those were two of the most unknown, uncharted territories for me when I first met him. Okay, you have to make the voice of a robot terror for a sound designer, and you have to give this robot arthritis. <laughs> How am I gonna do that? But uh, fortunately, through the conversations with the scientists at JPL, I discovered the cause of it, which was indeed that from those big windstorms and tornadoes, sound was being, I, I sound sand is, 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 is injecting itself into every tiny list, little orifice and causing, you know, friction points where parts had to move like the robotic arms and, and other, you know, the wheels. And so it, it, it pointed me in a very clear direction of recording um, new elements by taking beach sand and, you know, stuffing it into stuff like bicycle gears and door hinges and then putting a microphone really close and pressing really hard so you really felt the silica kind of grit and scrape against steel and that's those those are those are the components that were um sweeteners if you will to the existing sounds of like the servo motors for all those components moving overlay it with all this gritty stuff that made it feel like ooh that's just not going to last that's just not in good shape I do want to touch on on the narration from Angela Bassett, uh, which is just a lovely audio uh, element. And Ryan, can you talk about what you needed to accomplish emotionally with that uh, narration? And Mark, how did you handle it and treat it? Because it sounds very different from the other elements in the film. So I don't even call it narration, what Angela's doing in our film. Everybody, everybody else does. And I think she just won an award for best narration, which was thrilling. But I see Angela as playing a part. She's not doing, you know, Morgan Freeman and March of the Penguins and telling your audience um, what to think or feel. We discovered early on in our research that that NASA kept what's called an analyst notebook. It went straight to the Internet every day. And it was a pen to paper daily account from a human at NASA who was tasked with writing up the daily events. And. That sounds small as a device, but it's huge when you're a documentary filmmaker and you have something that is written in present tense that keeps you in the moment when you're trying to make an adventure tale, when you're trying not to make something retrospective. And so we had this modern day voice, you know, when you're in the middle of a crisis or you're in the middle of a discovery or you don't know if she's going to wake up the next day. Um, and so the idea from the beginning, even when we were scripting out the film, we were using those analyst notebooks to help anchor us between Earth and Mars. They were like our transitional scenes. Um, and Angela was the voice I had in my head from the very beginning. I love her so much. And I wanted a voice that was 
that was emotional and was empathetic, but that was maternal, that was like protective. Um, and Angela was a voice that I felt like could do all of that. Um, and I was, again, for sure, like the Beatles and ABBA, like, and Mark, like Angela's going to say no, but we might as well ask her. We'll never know unless we go to her. And she had watched a rough cut of the film and she loved it and said yes. And so, you know, a week later, we had just locked picture. We were we were recording with Angela. And I mean, when you bring when you bring a thespian like that, um, there's things she can do that I could never imagine that she could do with the subtleties and nuance of her voice, just little changes in modulation and a syllable here or there where I would have goosebumps um, in the booth with her as she was doing it. Um, and Mark, you know, had the idea of, of let's record Angela differently. You know, we wanted her, she's not a narrator and she's not an interviewee. She's playing like the internal compass of this entire collection of humanity and said, Mark said, let's treat her voice differently than we will treat our interviewees. And I will let Mark speak to how he pulled that off technically and what, what impact that has in the theater. Her voice was so vital. And I love the, the, the term you just used, Ryan, internal, um, because that's what gave me this idea to make the audience feel as though they're inside, they're, they're deep inside the, the conscience of the movie. And um, to that end, um, I, I also didn't, and, and because we wanted to do something different, you know, traditional voiceover is put out a U87 and you put it in the center channel and you lock it there. And I wanted something other than that. I wanted to feel internal inside something. So we put out three Neumann U67s and put them in an LCR array. And I asked her to speak very closely to it. A um, lot closer than normal voiceover, maybe six or eight inches away from the mics so that you got all that, the richness, she's got a beautifully rich, um, creamy voice. And when you get close, you get that proximity effect and it feels more intimate when you get that close to the mic because she was never going to be shouting or screaming. And I thought this is gonna make the audience feel like you're right next to her and she's telling you some kind of secret. And then uh, using those three mics, I would spread them across fronts but I also took the center and pulled it a little bit off the front into the surrounds. So in a way you felt like in this beautiful kind of cocoon, you've internalized that character and it, that's what we did. I mean, it's a very simple approach, but it's a emotionally so effective and just a, a beautiful way to, to handle that. So before I let you go, um, Mark, I know the, uh, the, the film is streaming right now on prime video and Dolby Atmos uh, for those who, uh, for those who are so equipped, what are some, uh, what are some nice, some wonderful Dolby Atmos moments that you want uh, people to listen for as they, as they listen to the film? Well, certainly if you're, you're, you got, you got the overheads and you got the subwoofer, you know, the, um, the entire trip to Mars, um, starting with the solar flares and ending with the landing, there's all sorts of good fun stuff in the surrounds and overheads and some, some really delicious subwoofer moments in that section. I would say that that that's pretty much a highlight. Uh, what else? Probably, 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 probably the probably the dust storms, right? Dust storms are are pretty powerful. Yeah, we 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 built some really nice immersive winds that swirl around in a circle in the theater, so you would hear that at home if you have a nice sound system. Not so much on a on a device or a. <laughs> That sound if, yeah, if you if you're if you're listening to it on your phone, yeah. Well, exactly. Ryan and Mark, thank you so much for coming on the Dolby Podcast today to talk to us. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time, and when I saw the film at Telluride, uh, I was hoping that we would be able to sit down and talk about it because, you know, we don't we don't get to talk about great sound design and mixing and documentaries that often, and so it's a real it's a real pleasure to be able to spend some time talking about your creative use of sound design in this film. Thank you, Glenn. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Glenn, for having us. Thank you once again to Ryan and Mark for joining us today. An extra special thanks to our friends at Prime Video for helping us put this conversation together. As I mentioned up top, Goodnight Oppie is available to watch on Prime Video's streaming service right now in Dolby Atmos. As always, we'll have a link for you in our show notes. And if you haven't already, please make sure you're subscribed to us 
the Dolby Institute podcast. With awards season heating up, you can expect some big conversations here in the coming weeks. And you can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms in our show notes. Or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, thanks again for joining us. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sunny Chen. Thank you again for listening.